Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 9, titled Bought and Paid For. It originally premiered on November 29, 1985. It was written by Martin Cup- Cupfer? Cupfer? He also wrote a couple other episodes that are going to come in the future, Kill Shot and uh, Duty and Honor. It was directed by John Nicolella, who we know well. He has directed a bunch of episodes before this one. He still has three or four more left in this season. He is also the show's producer. He will get out of the way at the end of season two for Dick Wolf to take over. We are well acquainted with John. Before we get started, I'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I feel like I have to talk about the movie that we watched last night, Turn of the Killer Tomatoes. (laughs) i have to mention it for two reasons one the title is very misleading there are no real killer tomatoes inside of that movie no they're all regular tomatoes just regular (laughs) what beefsteak tomatoes (laughs) which are the worst tomatoes i I was inspired enough to kind of look at i wanted to see what the rest of the series was you know how many movies in total they The one we watched, Return, Killer Tomatoes, was the least amount of Killer Tomatoes. (laughs) There were many more Killer Tomatoes in the original Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. And from what it looks like, the two fantastic movies that came afterwards. It was so great. um, It was so great. Everything, all the tongue-in-cheek references, the man that was master of disguises dressed as the Lone Ranger. I mean... (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty good. That wig. I I had a hard time... Believing he wasn't Johnny Depp. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the other thing I wanted to point out with this movie is that there is a Miami Vice reference in the movie. Oh, yes, there is. (laughs) They make, they turn a tomato into Sonny Crockett. (laughs) (laughs) Also, it should be mentioned that George Clooney is in it, too. Like, it's one of his first starring roles. And he really mailed it in. I mean, he really... (laughs) <laughs> he just he's like wow I'm pulling the script out <laughs> <laughs> I don't even right think there was the I don't think there was a script you guys I think this was just all like let's just go make a movie let's just throw some tomatoes which <laughs> well, by I, the way there wasn't any tomatoes at all like not only just killer tomatoes there wasn't hardly any tomatoes except that fake fuzzy one with legs <laughs> <laughs> it was like a dog, though. That wasn't color. Um, I, you know, I just I remember watching that movie when I, that movie when I was younger, and I remember how bad it was, and I and I just it always makes me think like that was like late eighties like Sharknado. It legitimately went to theaters. You know, it's like it's not a DVD. Like it was in theaters. People saw it in theaters. They it, even it's, made it into also, a cartoon series. Yeah. Oh God, you know what? I remember that cartoon. Yeah. Well, let's let's get over and talk about this episode of Miami Vice, which is going to be starkly different than Return of the Killer Tomatoes, because this is a very, very dark episode. So let's go over there and go talk about this episode. Okay, John, we open up very much like you have suggested throughout the, the run of the show so far. We open up, it's kind of silly in the beginning, because after the silliness, it gets very, very dark. <laughs> we open up with yeah. Gina... She's shopping. She runs out to the bug van, which I have to say, the bug van has a sweet, like, Mountain Dew paint scheme going on <laughs> right now. Green and yellow, yeah. <laughs> Do the B team always take the girls shopping, or is it just specifically Gina? <laughs> well, they're like, I can't figure out, because they're in the middle of, like, a, a sting. Like, she had, she stopped to go shopping. In the middle of, yeah, she, it's like she stopped to get her shopping done before the mm-hmm. day, and it just happened to be in the yeah. middle of their big sting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and who would have thunk it? She runs into someone she knows. <laughs> yeah, she runs, she drops the, the dress off in the bug van, she runs back into the grocery store and tells her friend, Odette, to finish up her grocery shopping, please, and take it over to her house. And also, by, and because I have a, a big hot date that's going to be coming over, I want to cook them dinner. So can you please drop stuff off her? I have to run. And also, can you put the groceries away, cook the dinner, clean my house, and feed my cat? <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> she runs back outside and she jumps in the car. I guess she jumps in the car with Crockett at some point in time. Odette's her friend. They're old friends. She laughs it off. She was grocery shopping there anyway, apparently. No, no, she works there. You guys are not understanding. Uh, she works there. That's what she does. Like, oh. she makes deliveries and stuff. So that's what. That's why she was telling her to deliver it, because she worked at that store. God she just man. thought she was just going up to some girl who was her friend and be like, hey, by the way, can you deliver my groceries? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, also, yeah. for the record... So, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. 
What? Wait, wait. So the, does that is she moonlighting for the Bolivian general who she yeah. also works for? No, no, she or doesn't she moonlighting work. at the grocery store. No, no, store? You, you, you missed the part where she she doesn't work for the Bolivian general anymore because of the sun. She had to stop working there because of the sun. She Gina tells Crockett at one point in the show later on we'll figure it out, but she said like she does oh, she used to work for a Bolivian general. She doesn't work for him anymore. She works at the shop now. So she does like deliveries and stocks the shelves. And that's how Trudy knows her too cuz Trudy shops at that store too. And mm-hmm. Trudy talks about like, "Oh, yeah, Odette, something about Odette." So she's yes. a delivery girl. That's what she, it wasn't like that she just ran into her friend and said, "Hey, by the way, can you go <laughs> do my shopping for me and then drop it off at my house and I have a fancy dress for you in the closet." <laughs> so it's kind of worse then, right? Cuz it's like Hey, Odette, I know you work all day and do this all day, and then when you get off work, can you do this for me? Exactly. Yeah, that, that is worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to have another question later, but let's get to Izzy and Manny, Man of Mystery, <laughs> the greatest sidekick. I'm going to start claiming to be Manny, Hawaiian, by the way. <laughs> no one can prove otherwise. Yeah, cause exactly. Is. Well, so, I had well, extensive plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> it was a horrible I, fire. I was Massive say, hair yeah, reduction. I, I was going to say mostly hair surgery. I'd have hair surgery to have my hair <laughs> reduced. <laughs> well, what what Gina is running off to to be go to like they're staking out a warehouse. Gina is with Sonny. The B team is there in the in the Buck van. Uh, Tubbs is there. I don't know. Perhaps Trudy is with Tubbs. I don't remember seeing her in, in the car. And inside, there's a deal going on. Izzy comes walking in. The amazing, fantastic, greatest living actor, the legend <laughs> Izzy Moreno, comes walking in with with his manservant Manny. Again, doesn't say anything the entire time. You get the sense when the way Izzy is talking to the two other gentlemen that are there that he's gonna make a deal for Coke. He pulls out a bag, a big zip zip zi- zi- ziploc bag. He explains how pure it is. No need. It's not. It's never been. It's never been stepped on. He specifically says that. He takes a knife, he cuts open the bag, and he goes to taste it, says it's pure. And then that's when the vice team, who's listening in on it, decide to make their move. When the doors open up and the vice team runs in, Izzy and Manny, Izzy smashes the bag of powder into one of the gentlemen's face, and then him and Manny run off. The vice team moves in on the two other gentlemen who are making the buy, and that's when we find out it's not cocaine. It's artificial sweetener yeah. so they can make soda. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's all over the place. Like, Izzy smashes the bag and it goes everywhere. Don't they know that's how you get ants? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're going to get bugs now. <laughs> I, I am so curious at this point in the episode. I'm so sucked into the artificial sweetener robbery. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> the caper of the year, caper of the century, artificial sweetener robbery. <laughs> exactly. At this point in the episode, I'm so excited. I'm also curious why the Vice would, did they hear there was a Coke deal going down? Okay, Why so, but- are they staking out? Um, they talked about Pepsi's that guy. headquarters. That guy with the long hair who was there, they talk about him. Remember? Okay, so when when the scene first happens and you see Crockett is waiting in a car separately from Tubbs, Tubbs says, Does your, has your informant ever worn a wire before? And Crockett's like, don't worry, he'll do what he's supposed to do. He knows what he's supposed mm. to do. So the guy mm-hmm. with the little ponytail is their informant, and he's supposed to, the he agreed to do this. Because he thought it was going to be a drug deal. And mm-hmm. so he told them about it. Like, oh, I have a deal set up. It's going to happen. And they so they could do you- put a wire on him. And then, then he got there and he said he didn't know what it was. He goes, I just realized that the deal was bad when I got here. That's what he says when they go in there and they figure out it's Coca-Cola or whatever. It's for Coca-Cola. <laughs> Question two. Do you think that Izzy and Manny have been going to restaurants and taking all of their artificial <laughs> creamer and pouring them into Ziploc baggies? Yeah, um, I wondered, like, is that all they, they have? Or, is that one bag? Or, or is that all they have? Is that one bag? <laughs> or, or are they the inventors of, uh, what is that other stuff? The new stuff? Sweet and low, uh, Stevia. Or... Yeah, Stevia. Stevia. Yeah, they are. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's what we know about this situation that we hear in the conversation. One person says, you can't bring us down for just buying fake sugar. There's nothing wrong that's happening here. But we basically put together that Izzy and Manny held up a truck shipment of artificial sweetener. And then they were going to sell it to people who wanted to get into making diet soda as if they had to do some secret deal. And that's why when they first come in, it's like, I don't understand why we need all this secrecy. And Izzy's like, you can never be too careful. 
Yeah, because they don't. I don't think they 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 knew it didn't need to be illegal. So mm-hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> so just to cap off the vice squad's incompetence, on his way out, the masterful Izzy Moreno steals the bug van. <laughs> yes, they still decide to arrest the people who are making the deal. Izzy and Manny had run off. They still arrest the other people. Crockett's kind of laughing to himself at it. The B team is taking the the suspects out to the van and they get outside and they in. Zwitek's just like, son of a bitch, and the bug van is gone. <laughs> yeah, I know. Zwitek's reason for saying son of, the, of a bitch is my favorite, too. He's like, son of a bitch, my lunch was in there. I was just going to say that. Yeah, his lunch was in there. Yeah. That's the other thing I wanted yes. to say about this scene is that when you first see the stake out there, but before they go in and make the bust, I am convinced that Zwitek and Zito... I don't think that's how their parts are written. I think that's their great acting that makes these characters because they show Zito and he's reading a book about Miami or like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And, Miami Chronicles or something like yeah. that. And then Slytek is eating and he's got food all over his face. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that these two actors did a great job portraying just, these characters that's just how they are that's just what they don't even think they're acting at this point so why take it just that really that way in real life oh. yeah and i want to point out that i believe who i've nicknamed vice jesus um <laughs> is, is he wearing a bowling shirt yeah yes. he's wearing like a it says i think it has his name on it and stuff so like they just don't even care anymore <laughs> no no like it's such a stop shaving it's such a staggered difference between Tubbs wearing like a three piece suit every day to Vice Jesus in his <laughs> bowling shirt. And those white pants, they were like wearing the same identical pants. That's all I could think when they when they came out with the suspect. I'm like, why are they wearing like matching pants? Like those white linen pants. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, after they see that the bug van is gone, we go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, Odette is just skipping up as happy as can be, bringing Gina her groceries to her apartment. It's a great 80s apartment. We've seen her apartment before, which I'll bring up later. I have my suspicions, but my first suspicion kicks in right now. Her apartment looks an awful lot like Trudy's apartment if you were just to shuffle the furniture around. Yes, so the yes, always yes, yes. budget conscious Miami Vice writers find a way to make that work. No one pays attention to the women. They can live in the same spot. <laughs> hey, we don't even we know where Tubbs set. lives. We've never True. seen we've never seen where Tubbs lives. I don't I think he lives in his car. I don't even I think, think he, he has a house. He might still live in New York. I think he lives in <laughs> Chicago. Yeah. Maybe he loves with he lives with Crockett and they just don't want you to know. True. Yeah. He bunks with him. He lives like, in a little dinghy <laughs> dock next to the to the boat. <laughs> yeah, just ties it up so he doesn't float away at night. <laughs> Odette comes into so, Gina's apartment. She tosses down the groceries. You see a dress hanging on the door. So she excitedly runs in. She starts trying it on. And then you see from behind her the door open and in come a man. He's got a knife in his hand and he starts advancing towards Odette as she's changing. So uh, just to stop right there, this is one thing that bugs me a little bit. Okay, I get he could have been following Odette up to this point and that's how he knew she was in her neighbor's apartment, but since we didn't see any of that, what the hell is he doing in Gina's apartment? Yeah, well, first of all, it's not, the na- they're not neighbors, so I should say that, first of all. So they don't live anywhere near each other. So he, that, that bugged me too. I told Dominic that. I said, that's all, this is the only thing that bugs me about this episode is that they don't make it clear that he followed her here. Did mm-hmm. he just randomly show up at some apartment? Yeah. And then you go like, oh, wait a minute, he knows her. I thought he was a random rapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I'm thinking like, what's this guy doing in Gina's apartment? Is he like Gina's new boyfriend? And, and the whole time I'm also thinking, what does this have to do with fake sugar? <laughs> True. <laughs> Turns this out not much. Like, what does this have to do with the, the sugar theft? Like, shouldn't they be working on that? <laughs> I need an end to the sugar theft. Where did they get it? Where did it go? <laughs> what was the ultimate plan? How did he find a buyer for yeah, fake exactly. sugar? <laughs> How much did they use? Exactly. Did they try it? Did they try to make their own soda with it and it didn't work or what? Is it actually better? <laughs> We're making light of this scene because it's this, not funny though, really. No, the scene is not funny at all. As she's it's excited, not, it, it, we went from we went from very lighthearted to the opening credits to about as dark as it dark as it could get. Exactly because this this scene is really impactful, right? She's excitedly trying it on. She turns around and sees him. He just starts advancing toward her, 
and she, you can see she's immediately afraid and and for obvious reasons there's a man with a knife but also like i don't like you anymore basically you need to leave me alone the the conversation is very much like i thought we were through i was hoping i was never going to see you again and he just advances with his knife lays her down on the sofa and you see her crying and then we fade out from that scene but you know exactly what he's there for he's there to mercilessly rapes her inside of gina's apartment yeah pretty much i mean he tells her you know you can't get away from me and i don't take no for an answer no one tells me no basically this is very dark it's a very dark serious episode uh this is a very dark scene so when we after we fade to black we come back we're at the precinct Gina is on the phone. She's on the phone with her hot date that was supposed to come over, and the hot date is canceling <laughs> on her. Not so hot, are you? No. <laughs> no. She's having the worst day. The <laughs> well, sugar... she didn't know how bad it was going to get yeah. at that point, though. <laughs> the sugar bust went bad. Her hot date's canceling on her. And then she asks as Trudy leaves. Crockett goes to walk by. Crockett's looking fantastic. Pants up to his nipples. Black sleeveless <laughs> shirt tucked in. He's got his gun holster on, smoking a cigarette. He walks by and Gina says, and I have a lot to talk about this, this stuff that happens between Crockett and Gina in this episode. Gina says, hey, you want to come by for dinner? And Crockett goes, eh, sure, I could eat. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, mean, I need to eat anyway. Like, whatever. <laughs> and then Gina goes, See, oh, it's I, better I've than nothing. This, I've stated this before. It is very clear that Gina is just Crockett's booty call. Basically, mm-hmm. in to try and explain, she would be his bottom bitch. <laughs> <laughs> After all others say no, then he would call her. Yeah, but in a way, isn't she doing that to him too then, right? She's just mm-hmm. using him because she's like, I had a hot date. You are not a hot date, but I'll take you because I got all this food I need to, and I don't have enough appetite to eat it. So <laughs> I don't want to have leftovers. <laughs> I'm going to explain my yeah. thoughts on what's happening here between these two later when there's another interaction between these two. Just briefly, what it is for me is that Gina is taking a different route to get to Crockett. So I'm going to come back to that later. <laughs> you psychoanalyzing this whole relationship they got going Riding on. Them with chicken. <laughs> I know how much he likes chicken. <laughs> so then we go over to Sonny and Gina. They're walking up to Gina's apartment and they see the man, the, the rapist, as we know was the rapist. He's leaving. He's walking by. They don't, neither of them really glance at him. They just walk on. They go up to the apartment. The door slightly ajar. They bust oh, in. Oh, Crockett they see takes him. notice. Yes, Crockett <laughs> does. takes very yeah. much mm-hmm. notice because... Mm-hmm. Because the rapist drives a nicer car than him. <laughs> yeah. If I could arrest this guy, I could get, I could this, get car. this car. <laughs> Dude, he takes off in the, he takes off in the Lamborghini, and that's just like a challenge to Crockett. So Crockett <laughs> goes running over to get his Ferrari. Like I'll yeah. show you. <laughs> well, yeah. Re- just real quick, they walk in the see Odette. They see what's what's happened to her. Gina runs to her side. Crockett takes off outside. You see the. Uh, rapist. We know his name is Nico. I'm gonna stop calling him the rapist. Nico. No, just call him the rapist. That's what calling he is. Him the rapist. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, with a name like Nico, what else would he be? <laughs> I think they could set him up. To and be honestly, the rapist. <laughs> I don't think I wrote his name down once as anything other than the rapist. So yeah. I'm just gonna stick with that. Crockett runs to his Ferrari. You see the Lamborghini take off. Crockett jumps in his Ferrari, and we have a great chase scene. And it's, it's, what makes it so great is it is really fast. And all the other chase scenes that we've seen in Miami Vice so far, you can tell they're only driving like 30 miles an hour, and then they're speeding up the film. In this case, <laughs> they're really driving fast around the streets of Miami. Yeah, well, you dude, know, yeah. and the director must have been so nervous. Like, this has got to be like the most expensive car chase in their show's <laughs> history. Yeah, those you two have cars got together. two, like, a hundred. $2,000 cars blazing down and you've got actors driving both of them. <laughs> Eventually, Crockett catches up to him, but not because he's able to stop him because there's an accident in front of them and Nico slams on his because brakes before the, he hits the car. Because obviously the Lamborghini's the better of the two cars, which is why Crockett's <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> Crockett comes out with gun drawn. He makes an arrest. He t- turns him around and starts to handcuff Nico against the car. Nico says that there's a couple of great lines here. Nico says, hey, this is a $200,000 car. Don't scratch it. Crockett then turns to the car and kicks it. Classic Sonny move. <laughs> yes. And then. I don't know why he's kicking his next car. <laughs> and then Nico asks, what am I arrested for? He's like, "I'm. how about this? How about reckless endangerment, re, uh, evading police, and rape? 
and then Nico says, rape. Look at me, amigo. I'm rich. I'm beautiful. Why would I rape? I could have any woman that I want. Yeah, he's a douche. (laughs) (laughs) When we leave after we see Nico getting arrested, we head over to the hospital. Gina and Trudy are talking to Odette. They're trying to get more information out of her. She's not being that cooperative. She doesn't want to stay at the hospital. Before they left. I thought Crockett calls Gina while, like, right after you arrest him, you know, and he goes for rape, he calls Gina. And isn't that where he, where she says, like, no, she said that it was a blonde guy? Yes. Well, yeah, but they go to, it's, they show the hospital first. It's like, they show the hospital oh. and then they say, like, oh, you have a call. Like, Gina gets a call at the hospital. Oh, and it's, and that's then it's right. Crockett calling, saying, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Gina says, no, you, you got the wrong guy. She says it's the white guy with blonde hair. And then they go back to the hospital. Odette needs to stay for some more tests. Gina and Trudy are convincing her to stay, that saying that we're here to help you. We go back over to where Sonny's at. And he's not at the precinct. He's at, like, the the, the jail. Uh, they're signing out Arroyo. His lawyer's there. He's getting him out, out, out of jail. Arroyo turns to Sonny and says, you owe me an apology. And Sonny, classic Sonny, says, I don't owe you spit. <laughs> well, he can't say the, what he wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just and think this guy is pretty arrogant asking for an apology. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he then asks for an apology. Oh, yeah, Royal says, you owe me an apology. Sonny says, I don't know you spit. And then Sonny gets really close to him and says, you should change your cologne. You smell like like a cheap pimp or something like that. And he said, he let says. me give you a tip, buddy. Get it, yeah, Buy a better cologne because you smell like a cheap pimp. And then, then of course, a Royal so, comes back. <laughs> I want to point this out. Right, right now with the cologne thing, because the next scene or so we're gonna put together what the cologne thing mm-hmm. uh, comment was about. Every single cop procedural show at some point has done the cologne angle. The oh, I've smelled that before, and that's how I caught the bad guy. And I just want to know: is there a single actual documented court case in which that is the case, where they were like, <laughs> we? The victim smelled like patchouli. That's how we figured it out. That's. How... I think it's just used as the introduction. Like, we know we have the right guy. Now we have to find more information on how to bring him down. And for the record, I'm they never wondering. did that on NYPD Blue. So, you know. <laughs> okay. But they did do it on Law and Order. Um... <laughs> I was going to say. But they never did that. that... Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, though. It's like, like, we've got him because they... It's got the same lipstick on the shirt or, you know, the mm-hmm. smell of this. Well, and it's always the, the thing that, like, nails the guy to the wall or, like, where you get the surprise, you know, oh, it was this guy mm-hmm. because he wears that same cologne. And I just want to know, like, is there an actual case in which someone is right now behind bars saying, I shouldn't have worn Brute? Like, <laughs> well, hey, no I one should wear Brute. Smell. Okay. <laughs> Let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> There's one last line in the scene that I want to point out is that Arroyo says when he's defending his clone, it's like, hey, this costs a hundred dollars an ounce. And Sonny says, quote, get out of here before I arrest you for air pollution. <laughs> Dad joke. <laughs> Bada bing. <laughs> <laughs> we go over to Gina's apartment and Tubbs and the B team are there. They're investigating the scene. Tubbs has some some information when he finds out that Crockett had brought down, had brought in someone named Nico Arroyo, where Tubbs says that Nico's dad is General Octavio Arroyo, who worked in, like, the government for Bolivia, but then stole a bunch of money, and then during a coup, he ran off to Miami. So, they're loaded. He owns, like, three Faleros. Like, they're just loaded. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he owns three banks. But, and then we also see... That as the vice team is cleaning up, one of the people that's there says, oh, there's a lot of evidence left here. And they're picking up the dress and putting it into a bag. And while he's picking up the dress, Zito, sorry, Zito that's actually picking up the dress, says whoever this was, or the lady, she wears a lot of perfume. Tubbs smells it and says, no, that's a man's cologne called Golden Warrior. Which, of course, of course, Tubbs would know about a cologne that's, that's named Golden Warrior. Yeah, I think he wears of course it. That's he know. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yeah, he talks about. It. Yeah, and then Crocky goes over, smells it, and puts it together. Yes, it is Nico that is the rapist. We are on the scent trail of Nico. <laughs> Follow the stink. <laughs> we go over to Odette's, and the ladies are there. G- Gina and Trudy are there talking to Annie, her roommate, and Odette. And it's just Sonny comes in. He goes to talk to her, and 
Sonny pulls Gina aside and tells Gina Odette's lying. It's not some white guy with blonde hair. She knows that it's Nico from, he knows that it's Nico from the Cologne. And then he explains who the Arroyos are. Gina says, oh yeah, uh, Odette used to work for some rich Bolivian that in a mansion out of Key Biscayne, which is exactly what Tubbs said about the Arroyos at Gina's apartment. So it definitely matches up. Odette, she immediately starts saying like, no, I can't say anything against them because they'll have me deported and Mm -hmm. he has so much power. You know, which, I mean, it fits. You know, former Bolivian generals have Haitians deported all the time. It's a huge problem (laughs) in New York. (laughs) Um, New York? (laughs) You mean Miami? (laughs) And this is also when we learn that she's not the first maid to be assaulted by our uh, rapist. Yeah, yeah. Odette goes into a story saying that Nico would never stop touching her. He was always making advances, always telling her that, you know, you're mine. There was another woman in the house that said that she had the same experience and that Nico raped her, too. And so and that's what Melissa was saying, is that that's why Odette stopped working now and now works at the grocery store. Yeah, because she said that the, there was like the head maid told her a story about another girl. She never mm. worked with that other girl. It was like she told her a story about how, how she he, he had basically done the same thing to another maid and that he had raped her and then she didn't work there anymore. So she mm-hmm. quit that job as soon as she, and the, and the, the basically the, what she said was the head maid or whatever said, like, you should quit because mm-hmm. he's not going to leave you alone. And so to get away from him, that's what she did. She quit, but apparently she didn't get away from him. The guy's dad must be, must be getting sick of having to hire a new maid. Right before the scene ends, Gina says to Odette, I'm your friend. I would never do anything to hurt you. There's no way that you can be deported. I'm here to help you. And you see the look on Odette's face where she looks skeptical, too, of what Gina is telling her. I think I'd be skeptical, too. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't work for immigration. She works for the Miami Vice. Like, how does she know the immigration is not going to deport her? I have questions on why Vice is even investigating this, because once again, um, what does this have to do with drugs and prostitution? I would assume rape would fall under some sort of special victims, major crime unit, some other police unit. But apparently Miami's only only has vice cops. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, vice, vice and, unit. That's it. And beat, beat officers. Vice team and beat officers. That's it. Well, they have yes. a robbery division and they <laughs> obviously have a homicide division. They just never pull yeah, them in. Yeah, but they suck. Yeah, they're homicide. Not very good. They don't have a homicide. <laughs> they don't have a homicide. We have a brief scene where we see the ladies pull up and they arrest Nico. He tries to ignore him, but Gina pulls her gun and they make an arrest. So, John, this is what you're talking about, though. They made an arrest on him now because of smell. There's Odette hasn't changed her. No, she does no, no, change her mind in that scene, right? No, yeah, and they talk about they have all kinds of evidence on him. So it's not just on smell that she said that he's the person. So she's accusing him. There's a whole back. There's a history between the two of them. They're not just mm-hmm. because of the smell. <laughs> they have to have actual <laughs> evidence. <laughs> <laughs> The next morning, we're back at the precinct, and we find out that Nico got out of jail, like, right away, or sometime in the middle of the night. Gina's complaining that it happened too fast, uh, but Trudy comes up and says she's got a ton of good news. All of the evidence matches Nico. They they feel like they have a lock on him, but right when they're getting ready to celebrate, Marty walks by and says, my office now. For the record, when, I really so yeah, don't like Marty is... in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, pretty much my my feeling with the scene with Marty here is basically Castillo t- basically breaks the news that no one cares about this case, and mm-hmm. neither does he. So yeah, I mean, that's basically, a- basically how it goes. Like, we don't really care. The DA doesn't really care about this case, and so we're not going to pursue it. So, like, go back to doing drug and prostitution things. Why don't you dress like a hooker? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, he totally, like, basically victim shamed. He's like, well, no, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because no one's going to believe her anyway because it's, it's his word against her, his word against hers, and it doesn't matter all the, any evidence they have. It doesn't matter. What, how does it not matter that they have evidence? Like, how does that not matter in a court that they it's have, total... like, fingerprints and stuff? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's total victim blaming because Marty specifically says, that Nico was going to say that Odette invited her him over there, and now she has regret. Like, yeah, but I mean, this... how did you not have, like, a cop, as if you're at a cop's apartment? Mm-hmm. Like, how does that, ha- like, work in your favor as a victim? I'm at my friend's who's a police officer's apartment. Why would I invite some man over and then claim he raped me? Like, what? <laughs> yeah. None of that makes any sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then mm-hmm. Gina puts up a huge fight. Marty eventually concedes and says he'll convince the DA to go ahead and at least file the charges so that they have a chance to do an investigation on Nico. Yeah, thanks for doing us favors, Marty. <laughs> we... Back at Casa del Rapist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Over um, at Casa del Rapist. We have a nice scene, the good Bolivian general coming down and, and basically slapping his kid, which is a really weak slap. So, I mean, like, we've seen Tubbs, you know, slap Crockett harder than this guy slaps his kid. Oh, I've so, drawn a total um, blank on the episode. What no, is where the, he slaps that guy. Yeah, what is it's that the episode? episode. Oh, yeah. It's the episode where, um, isn't it the episode where the girl is like on the, it's the other rape episode where that guy tries yeah. to rape her and it's her, it's her husband and, and Crockett's like shaking him up. And then as he goes to leave, doesn't like he slap him or something. And I'm like thinking of a different episode. No, they, it was, it. it was some kind of meeting they were having. They, 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 they're at some kind of meeting and they were playing all big badass and one of like, I, I don't know if he was like a dirty FBI agent or something, but Tubbs just slaps the crap out of him. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's the episode where the duo are posing as bank vault employees that are down in the basement oh, of yeah, the hotel. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's and right. And yeah. the, they have the hooker working and they beat for the them. Hooker up. Yeah, that's what it is. So, so then, so they have the hooker working for them to get them information. The, the crooked police officers who are running that, who are running the girls out of that hotel come to confront Tubbs and Crockett and Tubbs bitch slaps the fuck out of one of the police officers and says, like, you yeah. don't come talk to us that way. And then the real criminals like, hey, we like you guys. We're going to come work you <laughs> instead of these chumps. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 So nowhere near that kind of slap. You know, this is very, very soft. And um, basically dad says, hey, stop banging the help. Uh, son says, I, no. And dad says, oh, well, I'll take care of it. So, but I do want to point out, I like the good general suit in that, in that scene. The cream on beige with the, with the beige striped tie. Like, like man, you general's pimping. It does come down hard on, on Nico. I mean, for obvious reasons. Cause he gets Nico out of the pool. He's swimming around in his underwear with all his friends watching in the pool. The maid comes down <laughs> and says the journal wants to see you. Nico goes upstairs. His dad bitch slaps him and then tells him how much he's a bitch and then continues on to tell him he's a huge disappointment and he never loved him. Yeah. He said, uh, you're a disappointing firstborn. So which means that he's got another kid somewhere who's more important and is not an asshole, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then he, then of course he says, I'm going to take his, you stay out of this. Don't do anything. I'm going to take care of this. Yes. He specifically says, stay away from her. Don't go near her. Don't make it worse. I'll take care of it like I always do. And the episode, by the way, that we're thinking of is Golden Triangle part one. Ah, yes, yep, yeah, you're right. So after we leave Casa de Rapist, we go over to the precinct and Sonny comes in. It's like in the morning. Sonny just waltzes in and says, hey, so what did you guys get last night? Because the rest of the vice team worked all night to find any information that they could find. And Sonny went home to feed his alligator dog food, get drunk <laughs> and think of his glory days when he was playing high school football. <laughs> Well, maybe Tubbs was there in his dinghy off to the side, you know, <laughs> hanging out, too. <laughs> we can actually get very little Tubbs in this episode, and that's a little disappointing. Yeah, he doesn't get a chance to shoot or bitch slap anybody. Nope. Shame. Nope. But like as usual, when things are rolling along and start to get too serious, Miami Vice must cue the B team. And uh, <laughs> so the B team finds out where Izzy Moreno and the bug van is, and they're off. Yeah, so it just real fast. So I'm I'm unclear on something. I have to ask our Miami Vice expert. <laughs> the B team and the ladies say they got a name of someone named Nelly Guerrero, and so then 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 Tubbs gets the call and they said they know where the bug van is. So the B team says we're gonna knock out two birds with one stone. We're gonna go talk to Izzy as who's got the bug van, and then we're gonna get information from him on who Nelly Guerrero is. Yeah. Do we ever actually find out who the hell Nelly Guerrero is? Nelly Guerrero is the girl, is the other girl that was raped, the other maid. Okay. But they never okay. actually, sh- but they don't ever show her, and they never actually find her. No, to like to complete the story, they know they don't ever. Izzy never comes through. So he therefore, this the scene is almost useless, other than it gets the phone call. So we have two things that are only worth something in this scene, that because the Nelly Guerrero thing ends up being for nothing. Only mm-hmm. thing, only two things we get is we find out where the Buck Van's at, and we get a close-up shot of Crockett's nipples. Those nipples, yes. though, they could cut glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I do I have a theory. Though. Why? Why do they? Why do they? Why are they always out? This is not the first time. Okay. I mean, I am a Crockett. 
I observe him very closely. And I can say with confidence that I have seen those nipples a lot in the show. And I'm wondering, like, has nobody told him that his nipples are showing? Or is it like, is there a fluffer somewhere who is making the nipples come out? <laughs> like, for show? Do you think someone told him? That he has really nice nipples, and so that was, like, point of contract, you know? Like, I must show my nipples five I times a, a season. But I said it. He has ab- abnormally small nipples. Like, they are tiny. <laughs> like, the size of a pig really? head or something. <laughs> like, what is the deal? <laughs> and why are they always out? Why doesn't he wear an undershirt? You never see... We never have to see Tubbs' nipples. <laughs> well, Tubbs is always wearing, like, a three-piece suit. But he's sweating his ass off. Yeah, I, think, I think Tubbs, seeing how fantastically amazing Crockett's nipples are, <laughs> is jealous. embarrassed by his nipples. So now so let's go to the slapstick. I do have a theory about Nelly, though. Go ahead. I think, he has a theory about Nelly. <laughs> I think Nelly, even though we don't meet her in this episode because Izzy falls through, I think Izzy purposely makes it fall through because that's his sugar contact. <laughs> She's got the artificial sweetener. We're going to solve this sugar before the end of this. So we go over to the club where they find out where the dog van is at. And the beat team comes in and they are very, very angry. And Izzy is very, very surprised that they are there. As if they would never figure out where a giant bug van that is stolen from the police is that's parked on the street. As if he would, they would never be able to put that together. But hey, they took the giant bug off of it. So, <laughs> but the fact that it was painted that horrible color, those colors, how so, could you miss it? What was, what was Izzy and Manny trying to do there? Were they like trying to do like a photo session or something? <laughs> they had something set up, but I couldn't tell what it was. No, they had stripped the van. That's what it was. So they had stripped everything out of that van. Oh. Like they had taken all the surveillance equipment and stuff. And then when they, when the B team shows up, they're like, crap, we have to give it back. So that's what he's doing. He's literally pulling all the stuff he had out, like in his house, like wherever mm-hmm. they parked the van and he's bringing it out. Manny's bringing it out. Like here's all the monitors in- and here's this and here's the giant, the giant bug. bug from the roof. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Manny's just pushing it around. I, I have a feeling that they're going to keep that and put a saddle on it. And then yeah. Manny's going to have to push Izzy around the house on top of that giant <laughs> bug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, Izzy says, I know who Nelly is. I, in the connection with the Royals, I think it's just because he's basically at gunpoint. He's like, yeah, guys, that's good. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's go. And they just hop in the van and leave. We go over to Odette's. And Nico shows back up. He just decides he's going to go over there. And I think, well, I think what, what this is, is that he talked to daddy. Daddy said he's going to take care of it. So I'm going to go gloat, right? Like, haha, you're never going to catch me. I was able to do this thing. My dad's going to make this all disappear. Have fun and dead. So I think that's, Pretty what much that's how I saw it. Yeah, that's, that's, he's coming to do that. And then he's coming to do like what Melissa was saying is that he's really into Gina now. Yeah, once he sees her, he's like super into her because she's um like she's disgusted by him, right? He's like super into the people that don't want to be into him. And she's got like a strong reaction to him, you know, he's a jerk face. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's a jerk. And she thought and he's like, Oh, so I think he sees her as a challenge. So, you know, she's she's the ultimate challenge because she's a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when, after that very weird scene, we, he basically goes to mark his territory on Gina, then to yeah. rub it in Odette's face that you're never going to catch me. We go over to the club. So now we jump to an intermission. <laughs> yes. Time out while we go to a music video. So we're going to go to a Michael Jackson cover band uh, <laughs> playing two songs in a row. So, and everyone's going to be having fun at the club, you know, because it's not like we have a rape investigation going on. <laughs> yeah, um, I did say that. I'm like, taking her to the club, like, that's going to make everything better. Like, <laughs> go dance away your rape. I don't think it works and that totally way. they're just partying. They're yeah. totally just partying. Like, Tubbs is on the dance floor, like, just getting down. Yeah, you I was know, like, Tubbs is um, making a move on her. That's creepy. What's great about this scene is that not, not only is DeBarge on stage and he's performing, but Tubbs is out there dancing with Odette. He's not kind of making a move on her, but everyone else that's sitting up at the table, they're making fun of him. Like, look at Tubbs. Look at him go. Look at all that. that They're making fun of his dancing. <laughs> well, he is a terrible dancer. Yeah, and what's great <laughs> is Sonny's making fun of Tubbs dancing. And when Gina asks Sonny to dance, he's like, oh, no, I got a trick knee. You know? Yeah. Like, oh, bull. 
Yeah. You he know said, you got only, no rhythm. Yeah, he said only acts up when people ask me to dance. That's what he said, like, <laughs> as a joke. Like, it only acts up when people ask me to dance. So. Okay, so here's my moment to talk about what's happening here <laughs> between Gina and Sunny. Okay. I think what's happened is, is that Gina has tried the straightforward attempt, right? And she almost bagged Sunny. Straightforward, like, you like me, I like you, we should hang out. She was going over to his house all the time. Those episodes at the very beginning of the first season where Gina, Tubbs comes over and Gina had just stayed the night, right? So they were getting really close and then they got, and then they got pushed away after, and then there's the Uncle Polly rape episode. And so then things get really awkward between those two. So Gina's like, I'm regrouping. So the route that I'm going to go is like, hey, Sonny, me and you are just friends. Let's go dance as friends. Come over to my my place for dinner as friends. If you want to stay the whole night, I'm totally open to that. She even kisses him on the cheek saying that thanks for putting together this perfect night. But Sonny is not falling for it. He is <laughs> not going down this road. He knows exactly what's happening here. So what I love about your theory, Dominic, is that basically what you're saying is that she's to the point where she's about to try and just get him drunk just to get him in the sack. <laughs> yeah. She's about to just like drug him or something. And it, you know, and like never mind we're in the middle of a rape case. <laughs> I, I just like the part where you're like, she even kisses them on the cheek. Like that's scandalous right there. <laughs> no, I mean like she's playing she's trying to be coy, coy. right? She's, yeah, she yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's like I I didn't throw yeah. my arms around you. I just you know gave you a little peck on the cheek. See, we're friends. Ha ha, this is all fun. Take your pants off. <laughs> Take yeah. your pants off and dance around a little bit. <laughs> Like pretending like she's totally cool with like friends with benefits type deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh no, that's always been her thing. Like you can tell, like she's trying to be okay with friends with benefits because she, I think she thinks that if she gets you know Sunny in there for long enough, like to be hang out with her, then he'll he'll change his mind and he'll just be hers. But we already, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not going to happen. You should just see the writing on the wall all the times <laughs> you out of the <laughs> boat. <laughs> uh, eventually, you, like, row the eventually, eventually she'll there. get knocked up and then that'll be it. <laughs> I do like, uh, on a an aside here, I do like that we have this very deep uh, backstory for and Gina's intentions that like never come true. None of this is true, right? In the, yeah, in the future nope. of the show, they, they have a couple nope. more one night stands, but Gina like she goes off with another man. Sonny's like in and out of relationships. So none, all this is just made up story that we're filling in the gaps on right now, right? <laughs> for the record, I don't think they ever like. I'm I could be wrong, and I would be surprised, but I don't think they hook up again. I think mm -hmm. that's it. I think that whole oh. thing is done. Like, there's no more, like, one night stands. There's, like, a lot of insinuation and innuendo, like, well, we could, you know, but mm -hmm. I don't think they ever actually do it again. Mm. <laughs> Literally. I don't think they do yeah, it again. <laughs> but, but back to what Dominic's saying, you know, I, I think it's perfectly healthy for us to manufacture this. I fully plan on <laughs> manufacturing some uh, sexual tension between Trudy and Crockett in season three. <laughs> So now that everyone had a good time uh, at the club, now we can get back to the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we can get back to the rape story. <laughs> well, we have some more funny stuff that happens, right? Manny and Izzy walk in. Izzy's looking very nice. He walks up to the BT and he <laughs> says he's got his network of people blanketing the city, looking for whatever her name is. He can't, what is her he name can't again? remember he the girl's remember name. name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we get a little bit of sad where Odette comes back to the table with tubs. They're kind of laughing, having a good time talk about hey do you have sisters and she pulls out a picture it's like yep here's my two sisters i send 50 dollars every week back to them and then it gets sad because they're like my sister's always concerned about me thinking that something bad will happen to me here in america he, uh, his mo the mom she's mm. always worried that something bad the mom's very poor she's got her sisters at home and then she sends her mom 50 dollars a week and she's mm -hmm. always but she's always been sad that I left because she's afraid something's going to happen to me. And then that's when the party kind of goes downhill. Like the mood yeah. takes a tank. Way to kill one. the mood, lady. Yeah. Way <laughs> to tell us about your mom. <laughs> well, in a, in, a, in a, you know, in a Miami Vice coincidence, it's a Miami Vice miracle. We go over to a scene where we see Odette's mom, who we just saw in the picture, walking off of an airplane and being picked up by two strangers. Gets in a limo and then go over to having a meeting with the general, Octavio. Arroyo, where he's offering this is clearly he's he's paying her off. We don't this we don't hear the co the conversation because the Debar's rhythm of the night song is playing <laughs> while all Which of this is, really is happening. Which is really inappropriate, right? Like <laughs> we're gonna ruin this yeah, young girl's yeah. life, but let's play some Debarge in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, we have that brief stopover from when they leave the club. You see that Ma o Odette's mom is waiting for her at her house. They hug. 
Then we go to the precinct the next morning. Gina comes walking in. Sonny is at his desk, and he tells Gina, it's like, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Odette just suddenly dropped the charges, said it was a misunderstanding. That she had invited a royal over. And so, of course, Gina so and Trudy run Episode out the door. should be over, right? <laughs> so they that race. Be it. They race, but see, the ladies, they race over to Odette's place. And a limo comes pulling up outside of Odette's place. Trudy goes up, flashes the bed, finds out an amazing, staggering amount of information. Finds out that the limo just dropped Odette's mom off at the airport, flew first class window seat. And on her way back to Haiti, and that he's normally the limo driver for a royal's lawyer. Like, good job, Trudy. You got yeah, all that out of the limo <laughs> <But> driver? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the episode, I was trying to figure out, like, how much does rate cost, I guess. <laughs> and so, well, and we find out pretty quickly that it cost $10,000. So. That's how much the general had paid to Odette's mom. Odette didn't take any of the money. She gave it all to her mom. And then that's where we get this. Gina gets smacked in the face verbally from Odette. Like, you have everything. Everything you, You've always lived here. Everything you have is so nice. You live in a nice place. You know what $10,000 means to my family in Haiti. That's their whole life, a place to live for the rest of their life that's always ha- having food. After we leave Odette, we go back to the precinct, and Gina is letting Marty have it. She's just laying into him. Marty just asks, what are you trying to prove? Your job stopped when Odette dropped the charges. Like, you, there's nothing else that, you, that, that we can do here. Your job's done. And so Gina storms so, out. So once again, Marty's being kind of a D-bag because we know that Miami Vice never just kind of drops stuff. The thing that bugged me about that scene was Trudy going like, hey, I've tried. Like, mm-hmm. you tried, like, are you trying to say that she shouldn't be upset? Also a reminder, remember last week, so drop, like, Odette dropped the charges, you should drop it too from Marty. Remember last week, Marty was dropping from ceilings to kill yeah. people with a samurai sword. Yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> it, so it only yes. when it suits him, and it only when it has to... And he will see that he only does it with the girls. Like, he was super hard on Trudy when that whole thing happened where he was like, no, you need to take some time and all. He would mm-hmm. never do that to the guys. And if the guys, if Sonny had said, like, hey, I want to keep this going, this, I want to keep investigating, he'd be like, okay, just let me know what happens. But, you know, stay out mm-hmm. of trouble. But no, not with Gina. But they're lunch buddies, <laughs> so it's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sonny grabs Gina before she leaves. And says, hey, you're a cop. Odette, you're not Odette's conscious. And, but Gina's Odette made the wrong decision. I, I swore that I was going to protect her. And so he's like, you did your job. Odette, tr- trust you, you did everything you could. You're not the one that got raped. Which, typical Sonny, stick your whole foot, <laughs> foot up to your right knee, in your mouth. <laughs> down your throat. <laughs> Gina storms out, and that's where we go next. We go over to Gina's apartment. What we see is Odette goes upstairs and leaves the package at G- Gina's door. And I did miss, there was a, in the, one of the precinct scenes before, Gina was talking about that she bought, it was before the club scene, had bought Odette a new dress. To make up for the dress that she was trying to give her mm-hmm. when it got ruined. Like, Well, when Odette comes walking back up to her place, you see the Lamborghini parked outside. Which, why didn't she see that? <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, it's parked right, right there. It's like kind of around the corner, maybe. It's yeah. in her driveway. Odette walks inside of her house, and Nico's right there. He pulls out his knife and, and tells her, I paid you $10,000. I now own you. When we fade to black, we come back and we're at the precinct. Gina's looking at the dress and talking to Sunny. She's saying that if she wasn't upset, she wouldn't have just left this dress at my door. And Gina's also realizing that she pushed Odette to do the thing that Gina wanted her to do. And so Sunny's trying to say, look, you guys are friends. You can, you know, just go talk to her. You should have told her that. You should have told her that that's what you would have done. You you were telling her what to do, what you would do now. But when you were young and you needed money, you probably would have taken the money. It's like, maybe you should go tell her that. That way she understands where you're coming from. So that's when Gina leaves from the precinct and goes over to Odette's. And that's when she pulls up. And there's the police and ambulance are there. She goes and talks to Annie. Annie says that Nico came by again. Says that Nico owns her, but now God owns Odette. Gina walks over to see a stretcher coming out of the house, and underneath the curt, underneath the the sheet is Odette. She is now dead. See, and so I didn't know if he he killed her or if she killed herself. I wasn't sure which where they were gonna go with the ending, and I kind of think they went the wrong way. Yeah, this 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 ending takes a, a kind of an awkward turn because when we leave from Odette's the next morning, Gina goes over to Nico's, who's poolside. 
And she she comes over to call him out. Like, I want to want to see what you do after a rape. And Nico responds, oh, you talked to that tramp again. Gina tells him after you left, she slit her wrists. So she committed suicide. And then she goes to leave and Nico runs her down before she steps before she steps out of the house or steps back in the house to, to, to go leave from the pool. And he makes a pass to Gina. Yeah, he essentially says like, oh, you know, but I'm interested in you now. And mm-hmm. because and she's like, I, you disgust me. And he well, I basically says, that's what I like about you. Is that, you mm-hmm. know, that you, I, I can change your mind and I get what I want. And she basically tells you can't handle me and leaves, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is kind of a weird thing to say, I think. But okay. it was it's kind, of, it was kind of a weird conversation anyway, because she kind of shows up and you're not sure, like you expect her to be upset about her friend. Um, and you think being a cop, like maybe she's going to threaten him. And really, it's just kind of a playful banter. It is kind of awkward it's at just, the end of the conversation because she's kind of smiling at him yeah, when she says, you yeah. can't handle me. Yeah, Almost. I, think, I think she was like going there to tell him like that she had died and like she wanted to see his reaction. She went there because she was mad. But the ending really, well, you're right, like she starts heading in. It's like, what are you doing? Are you mm-hmm. flirting with him? And, and you know he's a rapist, right? And what? No. And you know what, though? It yeah. might set up this That's ending something. that she went over there to goad him. Because she knows how he would respond, right? I don't know. I went back and forth about that. Yeah. I have since I've seen this episode so many times, like multiple times. I always go back and forth. Did she do that on purpose? Mm Because other, I mean, obviously we're going to learn the rest of the episode, but did she do it on purpose? Did she go over there to set him up? Yeah, I don't know. That's what I was wondering. This is the beginning of this next scene. Probably my favorite scene in the episode. Let's set up the final scene of this episode, right? The B team, Trudy, Thompson Crockett are all at the precinct. And they're going to go out and get Chinese food. And they need to call Gina first to see if she wants to go. She's not there. She's at the house. She's laying in bed. She's got her cat with her. She's going to call it an, an early night. Let's talk about for a second how excited Switek is to go get Chinese food. Well, she's like, a, he's a Batman. He likes to eat. Okay. <laughs> he's like hopping up and down, rocking back and forth. Like, call her, call her, call her. We've got to go. Like, come on. I want to go. I don't care if she wants to go. Let's just go get Chinese food. Yeah, and then he uh, promises not to throw food at her, doesn't he? What he said, he goes, I yeah. promise I won't throw any food. She's like, yeah, I don't believe that. I'm like, what? What is going on? Uh-huh. <laughs> so now we have the final scene of the episode. She declines, she hangs up the phone. Everyone goes out for food. We come, we go, when we're at Gina's, it's dark. She has the lights off. She's asleep. And we see her front door open and we see the shadow of the, of the knife that Nico has. And he comes walking into her house. She, of course, as a police officer, Here's someone coming into her house, not not just as a regular person, but also with extra sensory. Here's someone coming into her house because she's a police officer. And, of course, she has a gun. So she leans over to the night table, pulls her gun out, and is Nico standing at her bedroom door saying, I'm just here to give you what you want. And he throws the knife down and sticks into the floor. And she, Gina tells Nico, don't or I'm going to shoot. And Nico just starts walking forward. He shoots. She shoots and kills him. And then that's the end of the episode. The episode just ends. He's not like walking forward like he's like, he doesn't just like, like lunge at her or come running at her. No, he's walking like, hey, baby. Uh, like, like, he, like, like this he doesn't think play. it's actually going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like he doesn't think it's going to happen at all. Yeah. I think that's the point is that he's supposed to be that he's that delusional that he thinks that she really wants to have sex with him. And so mm-hmm. he's like, she's not going to shoot me. That's why he throws a knife down. And then she shoots him because he's the stupidest criminal ever <laughs> who breaks into a police Man's house with yeah. a knife when you know she has a freaking gun. Like, mm-hmm. What? Yeah, and can it, can it has more legal justification for shooting and killing people? Yeah, knowing that, like, what yes. was going to happen? So he was going to go rape her, and then she wasn't going to press charges against him. So I don't think I will, he understands will, what rape is. I think that's what the point of this is: is that he really doesn't get it. He has no clue yeah. that what he's doing is rape. Well, that's the end of this episode. We all have lots of thoughts about the ending of this episode, so we'll save those for our final thoughts. So let's go over and talk about the DeBarge music, or I mean, the the, the music <laughs> of this episode. <laughs> all right, John, what you got for us this week? We actually have some music this time instead of like last week where there was hardly anything to speak of this week we actually have some including uh, basically a music video yeah so el debarge got quite a feature in the middle of the episode but we're going to start out here with sly and robbie who are a jamaican rhythm and production duo at the beginning of the episode we get their song bass and trouble see the play there play on word <laughs> trouble not treble <laughs> 
case you weren't paying attention. <laughs> so the, the duo consists of drummer Sly Dunbar and bassist Robbie Shakespeare. They mostly did reggae and dub style music. They teamed up actually way back in the mid 70s and are estimated to have played on or produced over 200,000 recordings. Damn. Yeah. They busy, but granted, a lot of them are on their own label, Taxi Records, but still, that's impressive. Yeah, that so, is amazing. So one thing I do want to point out, so when Sly met Robbie, Sly was drumming for a band called Skin, Flesh, and Bone, and Robbie was playing bass and guitar for a band called the uh, Aggravators. So they both met, and they hit it off. There was this big whole thing about how they their philosophies and... Yada, yada, yada. They uh, first worked together with, with the band The Revolutionaries, but are probably most well known for their uh, 1976 album, The Mighty Diamonds. So pretty much they were just kind of, they were just kind of musicians that just recorded on a bunch of stuff during the 70s. Throughout the late 70s into the 80s, they kind of helped pioneer the computer-generated music and, like, basically just making beats that, like, artists would sample and stuff, mm -hmm. not including mm -hmm. their own stuff. So, but, I mean, it's kind of crazy when you get through all the stuff, all the people that they produced, I guess, uh, played music for. They've produced everyone from Paul McCartney to Britney Spears to <laughs> frickin' Khalif. Wow. Uh, Khalifa. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's our first musical contribution. So let's go ahead and get into El De Barge. So we get their song, uh, El De Barge's songs, or The De Barge, depending on if it's his solo work or with the band. The songs You Wear It Well and Rhythm of the Night. So, and those are both in the club scene. I made, uh, so I mentioned, I, I made a joke during the episode breakdown that they're like a Michael Jackson cover band. So, they are literally like an identical story to the Jackson 5, I guess. <laughs> so, the Barge is a bunch of brothers and cousins and stuff who are in a band together. El the Barge is, is an American singer, songwriter, producer, musician, and the lead singer of the group, the family group, the Barge. A little background. So, their parents divorced when they were younger, and their dad was known to be physically abusive. Mm. At age 16, El DeBarge, that's, and I keep referring to him as El DeBarge because that's his first name is El, not like, mm. El, not like El as in Spanish for the, but like his mm -hmm. name. So, but at age 16, he had his first kid. He ended up having a total of 12 kids. Holy shit. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so, and. The man is a machine. Yes. <laughs> so, and dude, his whole family, he's got like, so he is the sixth of ten kids himself. <laughs> they are from Detroit. They mostly performed at churches when they were younger. He performed in the church choir and played the piano. Then the family also start, would travel around to perform at churches. In 1977, after fathering his first of many kids, drop out of high school, and began performing with his older brothers, Mark and Randy. In 1979, MCA would move him, like five of his brothers, four of his cousins, and his sister, Bunny, all to L.A., hmm. where he would end up performing for Motown legend Barry Gordon. <clears throat> and Barry Gordon would immediately sign them to the Motown record instead of MCA and create the DeBarges. So, the DeBarge's first couple albums, and like I said, this is like, uh, so, L is like the lead singer, and then he's got like three brothers in the band, like four cousins in the band, at one point his sister Bunny's in the band. The record label really kind of just focuses throughout the first, by the, by the uh, third record, just kind of makes L DeBarge like the focus of the band. He's the lead mm -hmm. singer, he's the guy on all the covers. They start treating them a lot like Smokey Robinson and The Miracle. After their 82 album, uh, in which his younger brother James got a lot of the focus, L would become, would basically take over. He would produce and arrange the music. And he was also featured as the primary lead singer after that. So in 1984, they would tour with Luther Vandross. They would become really popular. 
Basically, after the 84 tour with Luther Vanjoss, the Bards would go back into the studio, but they were kind of upset with L kind of taking the focal point. So pretty much they would leave him to kind of produce the entire next album and pretty much do it all himself, which would turn out to be their best-selling album, the album <laughs> Rhythm of the Night, in which we get the two songs featured in Miami Vice. So... Mm -hmm. Seeing the writing on the wall with his family not too happy with him, he would leave the group in 86 in order to start his solo career. And he pretty much cre kept making albums until about 1994. At it, within 94, he would stop making releasing solo albums. He wouldn't release another album until 2010. Part of the reason that might be is because 1995, his brother Bobby, who he was to be the closest with would die of AIDS contracted mm. through drug use. That would hit him really hard and he would just basically dip, fall off the map until 2010 when he would have a resurgence where he collaborated with Faith Hill of all people. Oh, weird. Yeah, totally weird. After the family band broke up, Elda Barge pretty much had a successful solo career and no one else really from the band did much else afterwards, so... Our next song is I'm So Afraid by Fleetwood Mac. I've talked about Fleetwood Mac, mm -hmm. I think, at, at some point already yep. in the show. But just to reiterate, they're a British-American rock band. They were formed in London in 1967. They sold more than 100 million records and are one of the best-selling bands of all time. They were elected in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1998. Some stuff I will point out is that... um from the late 60s until about 1971, they were primarily led by guitarist Peter Green. In 1971 to 1974 is considered kind of their modest area. Basically, it's the forgettable era of the band, mm -hmm. which unfortunately for Bob Welch is considered the Bob Welch years <laughs> because he was part of the band from 71 to 74. He would leave the band in 74. In 75, Stevie Nicks, Lindsey Buckingham, and Christy McVie would all join the band. And from 75 to 87, they would have their height of popularity. Most popular being their second album with Stevie Nicks on vocals. It, 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 interesting, I did want to point out as well. So... Fleetwood Mac was, was a name that Peter Green, the original guitarist, came up with. And the way he came up with it was by combining the names of two original members of the band. Combining Mick Fleetwood's name, who's, who was the original drummer, and combining original bassist John McVie, who was never actually, who never actually played bass, on any track or at any concert. So, mm -hmm. John McVie was originally considered to play bass, but instead they stuck with John May Mayels. What's weird about that is this is 1967 when they, when, when they, when he used John McVie, uh, McVie's name in Fleetwood Mac, even though he would, he would not go on to be the bassist. Mm -hmm. About 10 years later, or 8 years later, Christine McVie, wife of John McVie, would join the band during their heyday. So, and would be a member of the band. So even though her husband was never, never actually on any albums or anything, it's his name that was the creation of Fleetwood Mac, not her name. Interesting. Who, yeah, because obviously she didn't take his, uh, John McVie's last name until they were married, right around the time mm -hmm. she joined the band. Yeah, so, yeah. Finally, that br brings us to Cold Wind Blows by Carla Bonoff. She was a folk and soft rock songwriter, uh, singer-songwriter. She's actually more famous for being a songwriter than anything. To give you an example, the song Cold Wind Blows was recorded exclusively for Vice and didn't make mm -hmm. it on any album. It was actually never released in any other form except for on the Vice, for uh, this episode of Vice. Mm -hmm. She's most notably known for songs that she wrote for artists like Bonnie Raitt, Win Winona Rudd, Lynn Anderson, and she wrote a number of songs for Linda Ronstadt as well. Oh, weird. So she kind of has a country, like a like, country tie. Yeah, country and folk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so basically, like a lot of, she's written a lot of really popular country songs, which is probably why I don't recognize any of them. <laughs> like, I'm sure if I, if you knew 
Bonnie Raitt, you would know the song Home. I know that song. Tell Me Why yeah. by Wynonna Judd. Yep, I have I know no idea. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know those songs. <laughs> yeah, she wrote that song. She released several solo albums between 1977 to 1999, and she still works to this day. We'll bring it up that I see that all the time in doing research for these artists, that I'll come across someone like Carla Bonoff that I've never heard of, mm-hmm. and I'll see them say, like, Oh, and they're doing, still doing reunion tours today, you know, like they're still going and I always see it and I always kind of, I'm always kind of curious, like, are they selling out venues? Do they have like some cult following I don't know yeah. about, you yeah. know, or are they, you know, or are they doing like state fairs or stuff? So <laughs> yeah, it's like, like who's I decided, actually showing up to, to see them? Yeah. So I decided to actually go and see like, like investigate, like, what if I wanted to buy a ticket to a Carla Bonoff concert? She actually does have tickets for sale, and not bad. I mean, she gets 30 to about $35 per mm-hmm. ticket, and she does some big venues. Like, uh, she was at the Rose Garden in Portland, which is a pretty good size mm-hmm. venue. Yeah. That, yeah. That's pretty big, you know, but then she has some of these other ones that are mixed in. That are like she she did the museum of like musical instrument, mm. um, or she's doing that in like an upcoming week. Good for her, you know, yeah. still doing pretty big venues, you know. And I mean, thirty to thirty five dollars is nothing to sneeze at. Well, I'm sure you're happy that you actually had a week of regular music and not two songs that from bands that we have already talked about before. Yeah, it was nice, you know, <laughs> and, and and I was surprised at how. How many similarities there were between the barge and like the Jackson Five? Oh yeah, with- the similarities there with the barge and the Jacksons is creepy. Let's go over and talk about our final thoughts this episode. So I'm sure we have plenty. Let's get over there and wrap this episode up. All right, guys. I know that, and we hinted at it during the episode that we weren't necessarily the biggest fans about how this episode ended. And so I'm going to start off this week with the final thoughts. This episode was really good. It's really dark. They they talked. They covered the topic of rape really well. They were sensitive all around to all the parties and stuff. I don't, I don't think there was any. You know, I I think it's good because they showed the Marty aspect too. And then Gina was able to like veto him essentially, continue on with the investigation. So this was a really strong episode, but it just fell into the same trap that every episode has done. Almost every episode has done in this season where it just it, the ending is just awkward that him deciding to break into Gina's place to go try and rape her, then shoot and kill. Like it was like bump, bump, episode done. It just seemed like it was very rushed. It was very awkward. I want to say, I don't want to say it ruined the episode. But it almost did because of just how awkward the ending was. But in all, I'm a big fan of this episode. Yeah. I'm always a big fan of the episodes where the ladies are the primary focus. And I think they did a good job with this one. I really liked it. John, what well, are your final thoughts? I agree with you on the ending. And I, I'm kind of I'm kind of half and half on the episode. And it's not the episode. I think the episode, they did, a, like you said, they did a great job of talking, of dealing with great, just with how dark and serious i think that's what it was that kind of scared me it's like the show has continually gotten a little darker and a little more serious as mm-hmm. we've gone along and i think i would have fully have accepted a full episode about the sugar theft of 1986 <laughs> um, but i can appreciate them trying to be more serious and stuff i think what throws me off is when they do that is when they have such a serious episode and then they do that little slapstick comedy with the B team in between, I think it just it just makes it even more awkward. Sometimes during the episode when they do that, like if you're gonna be serious, just be serious. Like mm-hmm. you don't need to be goofy right now. So and I agree with you uh, completely about the ending. I personally I think the episode would have been fantastic had they cut it off, ended the episode with she shows up they, they, she finds out her friend's suicide, and then you, you end it with her sitting there upset. Like, mm-hmm. that should have been the end of the episode right there. There's mm-hmm. no need to carry it on for him, for her to go see the rapist, for him to break in and try and rape her and get shot. Like, it was all unnecessary. Major point by the time she killed herself. Like, that was, that was the serious part, you know? I don't know. I think I would have liked it better if the episode had ended at the suicide and if they just eliminated some of those times in which they didn't need the slapstick they could have just like 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 the uh the scene where they get the the b team goes to get the bug van back we talked about how that 
scene was completely useless. You know, we never met the girl they were looking for. It mm-hmm. had nothing to do. They could have completely eliminated that, and it wouldn't have been a gap. Well, Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Uh, my final thoughts are that I, can't, I mean, I agree with both of you. I can't argue that it is one of my. You know, it's up there on the list of favorite episodes. I like. I think they handled it very delicately, but also like showed you the true side of what rape is like, that no one's going to believe you, that no matter, you know, that this person can break in, basically essentially break into a policeman's house and rape her. And there's still mm-hmm. some kind of question as to whether it was rape or not. And you're right. I think they needed, I didn't like it and it made me mad, but yes, there had to be that, the side of it where Marty's like, well, no one's going to believe you because that that's the reality, rape mm-hmm. cases like that. And so they, they went out of their way to do that the 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 right way you know to to show the investigation i mean i don't know why they put the sugar <laughs> the sugar stuff in there <laughs> i guess maybe because izzy was he needed to be in another episode and they were like we're just going to stick you in there um <laughs> i don't know why that was in there and i do agree that the ending is weird it's it's like it leaves too many unanswered questions i will forever mm-hmm. think every time i watch that episode it's like did she set him up was that mm-hmm. like so that he would go to her house and try and and then like or do, was that like maybe uncon like subconsciously she was doing it and she didn't know she was doing it i don't know it's just really weird that part always bugged me that you don't get and you will never get an answer about it that's what the frustrating part is so yeah it probably would have been better if she would have died and then the ending was like her saying like she's dead and it's your fault maybe that mm-hmm. could have been better than and then leaving it at that and not doing the other part because mm-hmm. it's yeah. too confusing and it doesn't make any sense so yeah i would say that we really enjoyed this episode it was another good episode of miami vice we're kind of intrigued with what's happening in the endings here for the last few episodes but this was very dark very serious this is what miami vice does really well especially for our primetime show on network tv we do we are going to We're going to be the most controversial show on TV. They did a great job with this one. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe. Tell others who subscribe. Tell them to check out the greatness that is Miami Vice. They can see everything on how to subscribe at GoWithTheHeat.com. Contact us. We would love to hear from you. GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Or you can get us on Twitter, Facebook. You can find all the ways to contact us by going to the website, GoWithTheHeat.com, and click on About Us. You'll find all the ways that you can go hold of us. We would love to hear from you. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.